Thank you, buddy, for that good singing. Good to see everyone here today. We know we have guests, and we certainly hope that this is an enjoyable experience for you. And if you don't have a church home, we certainly want to let you know that you are invited here and welcome here anytime and every time that we have services. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking at 2 Kings chapter 5, 2 Kings chapter 5, a story that is familiar to many, uh, an enjoyable story in many ways. In 2 Kings chapter 5, we meet a man by the name of Dam, and Naaman had a lot going for him, uh, the kind of fellow that some of us people who haven't accomplished all that much in life would be a little bit envious of. He is a commander of the army of the king of Syria. Syria is a pretty big power back then. That's that's it's not some little renegade country. It's it's a pretty big powerful country. He's the general, top general in the country. Uh, he had climbed the ladder of success. He had probably started out on you know maybe a, a lot lower level, but he he caught everybody's attention. He was good at what he was doing. Moved on up, and he's described as a great man with his master and in high favor. A great man. He had won over the approval of the king. He was a man of valor, the Bible is going on to tell us. That's, that's a great compliment. We admire people of courage, of integrity, uh, and, and he was, he's described in that way. We need people like that in our world, don't we? We need people that we can count on. We need people that are honest. We need people that are courageous. We need people that have integrity. Well, we're told also that the Lord had blessed him and that the Lord had given him a victory over Israel. Now, that, that kind of throws us into a little theological uh, issue because he's not an Israelite, and yet God had blessed him with a victory over those people who were God's people. So that kind of makes you scratch your head and go, huh, don't understand that one altogether. But the Lord had blessed him. And if you accomplish anything in life, it is because not of your ingenuity. It is because the Lord has allowed you to accomplish. It's by grace that you have reached the point in life that you are. So the Lord has been blessing this man. But all is not well, is it, with this man who is described as a great man, as a man of valor, a man that had received the Lord's blessing, a man that had achieved great things, in life and that he is the general of all the armies of Syria. He was a leper. Now I, I'm not going to assume everybody knows what leprosy is, but I'm not going to spend much time on it either. It's a, it's a debilitating, disgusting disease. It's a disease that affects the skin and and is ends up affecting the nerves and ends up causing people to lose limbs. There are more than one variety of leprosy. There's one that is terminal. And we don't know which one he had. But all we know that if you're a leper, nobody wants to be around you. And so here's this man who has some great stature in life. And yet all was not well. And life is like that, isn't it? You know, just because you've accomplished some things, just because everything seems to be going your way, doesn't mean that all is going to be well in your life. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world that sin has corrupted and has brought a curse upon. And it's amazing to think about the consequences and repercussions of sin and how much they affect us on a daily basis. In fact, it only not only affects us, it affects all of creation. You read the book of Romans, and, and in that book of Romans, the Apostle Paul makes a statement I find just fascinating. He says, the whole creation groans waiting to be delivered from this sin curse that we brought upon it. That's amazing, isn't it? Planet Earth will be glad when God redeems those people who have, have accepted Jesus Christ and when sin is no more. The whole earth is looking forward to that day. And, and we ought to be too. 
But we live in this sin-cursed world and, and we have no guarantee that everything is going to go okay. And, and here we're rocking along and everything is looking good. Things happen. Bad things happen to good people. And another mystery of life is good things oftentimes happen to bad people. If you don't believe that, read Psalm 73. The psalmist was questioning that. Yeah, God, I, I just don't understand this. Why is it that good things happen to bad people? Jeremiah asked the Lord that question too. And the Lord called him on the carpet and asked him a few questions, but I'll not go there. Now, Naaman had been out on a, 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 on, on a war campaign and he had marched down into Israel. And while he was down there, he and his soldiers no doubt won the battle and took home some captives. And what we find out in the next verse is there's a young lady, a little girl. I, I think about this. I, I'm telling you folks, this is amazing stuff. That there's, there's a little girl that is taken captive and she's taken back to Syria and she is uh, made the servant to Naaman's wife. Now, I, I don't know what is going on. Talk about life not being fair. Now, there, there's a case of life not being fair. Here's a little girl taken away from her parents. I, and I think about that. I, I, if, if there's anything that's been true of me as a parent is that I was overprotective. I, 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 I lived in fear of somebody doing something to my children. I cannot imagine. I cannot imagine the horror of losing a child knowing that that child was taken away by, by an enemy and who knows what going to happen to that child. I, I, I just can't imagine that. So I think about the, the family of this girl back in Israel wondering if she is being sexually abused, if she's being uh, mistreated in any way. I, 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 longing to see her face, longing to hear her voice. And I think about that little girl, how traumatic that must have been to be ripped up from her homeland, not only her homeland, but taken away from her mother and her father. And here she is now, she finds herself as a servant in Naaman and his wife's house. And they may have treated her good, but she's a servant and she can't go home when she wants to. Wow. Life's not fair sometimes, is it? And yet this little girl does something I find remarkable. She's not filled with bitterness. And, and I don't know what's happened, or what all happens in your life or what will happen in your life or mine, but there's one thing that I know, and that is you and I do not allow, do not need to allow ourselves to become bitter. We just, we just don't need to do that. Bad things happen. Life isn't fair. But God never allows us to become bitter or doesn't want us to become bitter people. Things don't go our way. We're not to become bitter. Now, how do you know? How do I know that this young lady's not bitter? Well, I know that she's in lot, at least not filled with hatred towards Naaman and his wife, because she says to Naaman's wife, she says, "You know, if my master were in Israel, there's a man there that could heal him." Now, isn't this wonderful? She, she cares enough about these people that she is willing to help them, trying to help them. And, and I love this, and I think this is a great message for all of us. She takes an opportunity to point this man to God. She knows that that prophet has no power, no ability apart from God. And here she is in a subtle way pointing this man from a pagan nation to the one true God. And folks, you and I on a daily basis ought to look for opportunities in a subtle way or in an outright way point people to God because that is the one that we all need is the holy God of Israel. And she says, okay, if, you, if my master were down there, there's a man there that can help him. And so Naaman gets word from his wife about this. He goes to the king of Syria. The king says, okay, I'll write a letter for you on your behalf. We'll send you down to Israel. And we'll, you present yourself to the king of Israel. You present yourself this letter. And, and so you, uh, you read on. And 
the, the Naaman shows up at the king's palace. No doubt somebody goes in and takes the letter. And what you find out is when the king read this letter, he tore his clothes. He, he What in the world is going on here? This man is up to something. He's trying to spies out. We're, there's something not right about here. What is he expecting of me? He's just trying to cause trouble. In other words, this king just throws a little hissy fit. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this king. Because a lot of times... We don't pay any attention to him and are looking at this story, and, and it's important. His name is Jehoram, and it's later going to be called Joram, which is confusing because there's another king down in Judah going to be uh, called the same thing, uh, reigning at the same time, uh, and, 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 and he wasn't a good guy either. <laughs> but Jehoram uh is the son of Ahab and Jezebel. He's not a good guy. He doesn't have good leanings, to say the least. Now, his brother had already been king. He dies, and now he take, takes over. Well, there's this incident in which uh, Moab, this little country, uh, has been paying tribute to Israel. And they, they decide, well, hey, the king's dead. New king doesn't really know about us. We're not going to pay tribute anymore. So Jehoram says, well, I'm not having this. And so he enlists the aid of, of the king of Judah and the king of Edom. And they're going to kind of get join up and beat up on this little Moab and, and get them back in line. This is in uh, chapter 3, by the way, if you want to read it. You don't have to go there. I'll, I'll tell it to you pretty quick. Now, here they go. You've got three kings and their army going up against this little bitty country of Moab. And they're going out and make quick work of it. But they get out there and they march around for seven days and they can't find a drop of water. And Jehoshaphat, I like that guy's name, don't you? I mean, the king of Judah, he says, is in there... A prophet of God around. Now they've been, they've already joined up to, to, to march against them. They've gone seven days. They're out without water. They're just now getting around to ask God's guidance in this. I don't know about you, but occasionally I make major decisions without asking God's guidance, and I don't need to do that, and neither do you. But they, they get out there and they say, uh, Joseph says, isn't there a prophet of God around here that we can get some advice from? And now, Jehoram, he doesn't speak up, but his servant does. His servant says, there's a man called Elisha, and God speaks through him. And so they call in uh, uh, Elisha. And Elisha comes in and Jehoram basically says, well, tell us what we need to do. And Elisha is not, he's not as polite as maybe some of us would like for him to be. I love, I love what he says. He says to, to Jehoram, why don't you ask your mom and daddy's prophets what to do? See, his mom and dad's prophets were the prophets of Baal. Why don't you seek them out? There, there have been so much help. <laughs> now Jehoram is a whiny thing and he says, it is the Lord that brought us three kings out here to die. And so Elisha responds, listen, if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat being in here, in my regards for him, I wouldn't say a word to you. In fact, if he were not here, I would not even look at you. I like, I like his gumption. But he says, now here's what's going to happen if you read on. Here's what's going to happen. Now here they've been seven days without water. And Jehoram, uh, Elisha doesn't even want to look at him. But... God speaks through uh, Elias and He says, here's what's going to happen. There's a dry stream bed and said, what's going to happen is it's going to be filled with water. You're not going to hear it rain. You're not going to hear any wind. You're just going to wake up. It's going to be water here. All sorts of water. And He said, that's nothing for the Lord. 
So the next morning they wake up and there's all this water. And, and there's more to the story, but the point is, now here's the point. Jehoram doesn't want to ask God, but God helps him anyway. So that ought to kind of been convincing to Jehoram. But here he is again with a situation in which God can help him. And he doesn't seek God and he doesn't seek Elisha. There are just some people like that, aren't there? When the answer is right in front of them and yet they won't ask a question. When deep down they know that God is the answer, but they don't want God to be the answer. I'm telling you, it's frustrating when you know that there are people like that. And it's frustrating. God is the answer, and yet people don't want to know the answer. Now if you read on the rest of this, uh, this book, uh, 2 Kings, what you find out is God does other things to, to convince Jehoram that he is God. And yet Jehoram never does seek God. It's kind of like that passage where it says that all day long God has stretched out His hand to a disobedient people. It's just the whole time Jehoram is on this earth, God is trying to reach out to him, and yet He will not take God's hand. I hope that's not true of you. You know, there are none so blind as those who will not see. And Jehoram wouldn't see. Well, Elisha hears, no doubt, somebody at the king's palace lets, lets Elisha know what's going on. Elisha says, I want you to look at this. Uh, verse 8 of 2 Kings 5. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he said to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. Listen, I read that quickly, but I think that if if we pay attention to it, there's there's frustration, there's there's a rebuke in this statement. He says to the king, send him to me that he, Naaman, will know that there's a prophet in Israel. In other words, Jehoram, you refuse to see. But here's a man from a pagan nation that's about to see that there is a God in Israel and he has a prophet and it's Elisha. But here's this king who refuses to see. So Naaman comes to Elisha's house and, and, and most of you know the story. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. It's just an enjoyable story. Elisha sent a message to him. Okay, here comes the general of, of, of Syria riding up on his horse and here's his entourage and his bodyguards. And, and, it, and it's, you know there's a pretty good squad of soldiers there because they sent a lot of money too. So they ride up and Elisha doesn't even come outside. He just says, sends a messenger out and he says, you go tell Naaman to go to the Jordan River and dip seven times. And Naaman, verse 17, was angry and went away saying, Behold, I thought he would surely come out and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. I wanted some hocus pocus. I wanted a little show. I came a long ways. I wanted to see something. Are not Abna and Farvar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? I got creeks back home that beats this. Nothing special about the water. Are y'all listening to me on this? 
There wasn't anything special about the water, was it? <laughs> so these folks don't understand. They say, you church of Christ people always talk about baptism. You talk about baptism all the time. That's right. And proud of it. Because there's a bunch of folks that don't talk about baptism. But we know this. There's nothing special in the water. It's just that's where God told us to get. <laughs> and if God told us to get there, then by all means we ought to get there. <laughs> Shame on people for dismissing what God told us to do. Shame on them. Maybe we talk about it too much. But I'd rather be guilty of talking about something too much and not talking <laughs> about it at all. If it's something of God... But anyway, he's throwing his fit. <laughs> I, I could have done this. And, and, and by the way, he probably had done that in those rivers back up in Syria. He probably had dipped and scrubbed and everything else. But God wasn't involved in anything. Now he is. But he's throwing a fit because God, God through Elias and said, here's what you do. I, I don't know who said this. I'd give him credit if I did, but it's a true statement. If God had given us 1,000 ways to come to Him, there would be a lot of people that would complain that there wasn't 1,001. That's right. But now he didn't give us a thousand ways. He gave us one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. And that's a glorious way, and you can complain all you want, but that doesn't make another way. It is through Jesus that you come to God. Now, he's got another problem other than leprosy. He's got, he's got pride problem, and that, that stops a lot of people from doing what God wants them to do. But I, I, I would have loved to have seen this conversation. I really would have. He's, he's over here. You know, he's a general. He, he's used to giving orders. He's used to special attention. And he's over here throwing a fit. And, and one, of his, one of his servants says, You know, and the English Standard Version puts a little different twist on it, but I, I'm going to read it, but I'm going to tell you what most translations or the one I grew up with said. But his servants came here and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Now, the King James Version, I remember this, it, it basically says, look, if the, if the Lord had asked you to do something great, you would have done it, right? But the English Standard Version kind of takes the position that, look, what God has said is good. Won't you do it? Either way, you get the point. I, I would have loved to have seen, now this is, I'm a visual person, I would have loved to have seen his face. I mean, how, do, how does an angry man, and it's hard to teach an angry man, you right? I mean, the Bible says it. It's hard to teach an angry man. It's impossible to teach an angry woman. That's a joke. <laughs> I just thought of it. <laughs> it's not in my notes. <laughs> now, <clears throat> men... Men wouldn't have been afraid that said amen on that. But anyway, <clears throat> it is impossible. It, it's hard to teach an angry man. But he's in the middle of throwing fit. Your servant says, Won't you do what he says? I'd like to have seen his facial reaction. How, did, how he went from. You know, maybe that's not a bad idea. I, I, I don't know how much time elapsed here. <clears throat> it's a good thing I almost threw my voice is almost through, right? <clears throat> so he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. <clears throat> I 
Here's a man that has a choice to make. He can do what God says and it's going to change his life for good forever. Right? If he does what God says, it's not only going to make his life better, it's going to be a blessing to everybody around him. Right? That's not much of a choice. You do what makes your life better. It's a blessing to you and it's a blessing to others. Or you throw a fit and say, I'm not going to do it. Which is really silly. Thank God He submitted. And His life was made better. And His People around his life was made better. And that's what happens when you submit to God. Your life is made better. I don't know of a single person who's become a Christian whose life hadn't been made better. And I don't know of people, I don't know of a single person that said my life got worse when my family member became a Christian. I don't know anybody said that. Not if they really knew what they're talking about. Because you become a Christian, you make the lives of people around you better. So what do you got to do? Just do what the Lord says. Just do what the Lord says. And I close with this statement. The Apostle Paul, before he was an apostle, realized that he had been fighting against Jesus. He was filled with sorrow. He found out that Jesus indeed was the Son of God. He was filled with sorrow for his sins. And a man came into him and said, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. Saul had the same decision that Naaman did. I can do what the Lord says and be forgiven. I can refuse and remain a sinner. That's what you're faced with. If you need to respond, we invite you to come as we stand and sing together.